In the case of nuclear or radiological fallout, people living around potential targets such as military bases and chemical plants may be advised to evacuate. Well, hello, Sublation Media viewers and magazine readers. Welcome to the weekly Sublation Magazine show. This is Sublation Media's weekly live stream in which we speak with authors and discuss some of the issues of the day uh, and their relevance to the left. I'm Douglas Lane. This is Ashley and Frawley. I'm Ashley Frawley. <laughs> yeah. Uh, today, we're going to run a clip from an upcoming Diet Soap interview with Conrad Hamilton, uh, whose essay on Marx and labor certificates is available at Sublation Magazine today. And you should be able to find a link to it in the uh, description for this video. Before we begin, I'd like to ask you all to like and subscribe and hit the bell. Also, make sure you keep up to date with Sublation Magazine by following us on Twitter and on Facebook. Uh, although <clears throat> I didn't tweet out the link <laughs> yet to the mag today's article. Also, if you like what we do, please consider supporting us on Patreon. We've just introduced annual memberships, which we really hope people will take advantage of. If you sign up as an annual patron, you get a discount so that the first two months are free. Um, links are in the description. And if you feel so inclined, drop a super chat. We'll make sure we try to answer uh, all the questions that come in as super chats. Um, but, uh, you know, we can't say for sure. Right now we have about seven people watching. Um, I'm, I'm pleased with that number. Uh, and uh, we're going to be discussing... Um, uh, well, we're going to be discussing the underlying economic conditions, uh, maybe starting in the United States, but uh, around the world, perhaps, and try to get a, a some sort of realistic assessment of what our condition is right now. Ashley, I'll let you begin. Yeah, so there have been these uh, some claims kind of floating around on on social media that have been hinting at the fact that the U.S.'s labor projections and employment data is not quite as rosy an image as the American uh, government has tried to portray. And I think there's been a lot of spin generally around how the economy is, is faring at the moment, which is really amazing because um, for a long time, recessions were more or less normalized and naturalized within capitalism. You know, you have the idea of the business cycle and that sort of thing. And then towards this recession, there's been this attempt to kind of um, pretend that it's not really happening. So a few things have been going on, obviously, where people have just been pointing fingers at, you know, oh, it's all, yes, there are problems, but it's all because of the bad man in Russia. And yes, there are problems, but it's because of the uh, pandemic. So we've had a, an issue with inflation for a very, very long time. Um, and it's, it's inflation that appears to be almost uh, well, going to spiral out of control, but now we have a, a scapegoat. We've got the pandemic. Well, that caused the problem of inflation. Never mind the fact that currencies have lost enormous amounts of their value over the just generally over the last what 100, 150 years. They've lost uh, since the time of their um, inception. They've lost like ninety to ninety eight percent of their value. But no, no, it's all down to to COVID. So at the moment, there have been these um, forecasts that, uh, no, actually, employment figures are all right. But little by little, there have been some glimmers, not glimmers, some <laughs> spots of darkness that all is not good mm -hmm. and that things are things are bad things are coming on the horizon. So there was a, an article in Forbes. Um, yeah, I'll show you, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll share the screen for this uh, article. Get ready for a winter of discontent with layoffs, high inflation, and a plunging stock market. Uh, and if you just kind of read around, you can see that the, the domino effect of layoffs has started already in the tech industry. Um, there have been mm -hmm. warnings that if you work from home, you may be the first when the layoffs come. And how to, I, I saw one article, how to protect yourself if you work from home, <laughs> because the, the first layoffs are going to come for you. Um, mm. So it's a really, a really scary situation that we're finding ourselves in. But I think one of the most important things to understand is like, this isn't a real thing. You know, if you watch, if you watch TV, you watch the news programs, especially in the UK, they keep saying, we're in the middle of a cost of living crisis here. 
we're in the middle of a cost of living crisis. How could you go on strike? How dare you? We all have to bite the bullet. We all have to, you know, accept less, buy some blankets over the winter and just hunker down. It's not like humanity has lost the ability to, to produce. It's mm -hmm. not like, you know, we've got the access to wealth, the ability mm -hmm. to produce wealth beyond our ancestors' wildest dreams. And they're sitting here trying to tell us that suddenly it's disappeared. You know, this is what happens. You know, 15 years ago, they're all whining. Oh, 15. Oh, it was about 15. Yeah, 16 years ago, let's say. Everyone's talking about there's too much. There's too much. Oh, we're, we have affluenza. We're all getting sick because we're too rich. And now all of a sudden, in a crisis situation, it happened in 2008. Now, again, 2022 and moving forward into 2023, suddenly there's not enough and we all have to, we all have to accept less. Why? Because capitalism is not a system for the production of wealth. Um, contrary to popular belief, it is very, very good at producing wealth, the very best system we've ever had. But at a certain point, its internal contradictions come into, uh, well, contradiction with this ability to produce wealth and it starts to destroy it. And that's what we're mm -hmm. seeing right now. It is not an eternal system for the production of wealth and it is coming to its limits. Uh, you said something at the start that I want to get a better uh, handle on. You said that since the um, the money you know, has been introduced. In other words, I guess since the U.S. dollar first was on the scene or maybe the, the, the pound, the yen, that overall currency is devalued by like 98 percent. Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder how that kind of um, what 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 did that what that claim is really pointing at, because on the one hand, um, uh, the the what you could purchase with a dollar um has probably certainly declined but then again on the other hand the number of consumer goods the amount of uh te technological goods that are available to you um has vastly increased as has the average income of most people in the developed world and i think around the world you know globally so um when you're talking about the value of the, of currency declining, you aren't strictly speaking talking about the amount of actual useful wealth that you can accumulate with currency today, right? You're talking about the relationship between currency and commodities. Like yeah, that. I mean, this is not I'm not an economist. I'm not a Marxist mm -hmm. economist. I'm more of like a, I use Marxism in my own work in a very, very specific way. Um, but in general, obviously, to keep wages down, the reason why we have we're able to buy large amounts of commodities is because they are produced cheaply in China, right? And this allows wages to be kept down. Um, but I think or before that, they were produced cheaply in the United States after World War II during the boom, mm. right? I mean, but anyway, yes, go ahead. Yeah, but I think generally part of the issue that we're having is um, the fact that there's a, an increasing alienation between money and the actual stuff that it produces. And mm -hmm. this is what's happening within capitalism. It's not really, pro it's not pr productive of wealth in the, no, no, that's not, it's not productive of profit to produce wealth. Um, mm -hmm. And so these things have become like wealth being the actual stuff that makes our lives better and is the product of human hands and so on. Money mm -hmm. and, and, and wealth have become increasingly, um, alienated and there's a wonderful line in the Grindrisa everyone said when I wasn't here someone said but who will who will quote the Grindrisa for us I'm back to do it <laughs> and it, it is you it is you <laughs> um, but yes there's this wonderful bit in the Grindrisa where uh, Marx talks about um, greed brought down the ancients and mm -hmm. if you just read this not knowing anything about Marx you think that he's making some kind of like moral judgment about the internal world of the Greeks but actually it's this very wonderful uh, remark about the fact that um, the, the society had become developed enough that they were able to pursue wealth in alienation from, sorry, produce money, or pursue money in alienation, in separation from actual stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and as a society becomes more developed, this is what happens. Um, you, uh, production and wealth become more and more alienated. And in order to survive, you must pursue profit 
over and above the creation of actual things. So what's happening at the moment is they're trying to arrest, not trying to, that's like attributing too much agency, but there is this arresting of actual production um, because it's not, it's not profitable. It, it's, it's not profitable to actually produce things. Like why would you invest a bunch of money in a shoe factory, let's say, uh, to produce shoes when you can't be sure that you're actually going to be able to sell them? Uh, how, you know, why would you make a whole new company with all of these machines when you have to compete against Nike has been doing this for ages and has an enormous developed um, means of production and you might not be able to sell all of your shoes. Why bother? Why instead it makes a, a lot more sense to give people debt uh, and to, you know, pump up these enormous debt bubbles, give people debt that they have to pay back, um, like student debt, for example. And mm -hmm. you're, you're pretty much guaranteed a return on that investment. Why? Mm -hmm. So they, it's not productive to actually produce things in the world. And this is the, one of the huge contradictions of capitalism that we're seeing come to fruition at the moment that we pursue, not we, capitalists have to pursue abstract wealth, that is money, over and above actual wealth, which is production. So this is why I said um, capitalism is not a, a system for wealth production, contrary to popular belief, because at a certain point you produce the abstract symbolic version of wealth, which is money over and above the actual production of wealth. And where this, this is what happens now where like nothing's disappeared and suddenly you have to arrest production, throw people out of work to try to control inflation and none of it's real. Right. Well, I remember in 2008 that the same problem occurred where the, the, it wasn't because of any state interference exactly, but because of the, uh, housing and banking crisis, there was a, a reluctance and there had been a reluctance, I think, for some time. Uh, and maybe, in fact, neoliberalism is defined by this reluctance, but there had been a reluctance to invest in actual productive activity, you know, mm -hmm. uh, the actual production of commodities and a turn towards financialization. Um, and no, that hasn't gone away. That's just got that, worse. That's, that is only intensified. But the aim um, of the state at that time was to encourage investment, whether it was investment in financial assets, you know, by per, uh, like through the purchase of these mortgages that were devalued and, you know, th that still could perhaps produce a profit down the, the line through in, in a, mm -hmm. you know, in a strictly financialized way, um, or whether it was to encourage investment in actual productivity and therefore in, to create jobs the interest rates were put down to near zero for quite yeah. a long time. Mm -hmm. And now um, the interest rates are, are being, uh, in, the, the, there's an increase in interest rates. And the bet must be that um, by increasing the interest rate, it, even though that will discourage investment, um, it will encourage loans and it will uh, ultimately come out in the wash. And uh, by controlling inflation, um, it will, you know, in in the in the opposite way, encourage productive activity. It's like the the state is always trying to encourage production and the reproduction of capital. And um, and the only way capital can be reproduced is through ultimately through commodity production. It mm -hmm. uh, can't be done by financialization alone um so that's that's what they're always uh, aiming at and you know the mm -hmm. when you have uh an expansion of like the value in the stock market what everyone is ultimately believing whether they know it consciously or not is that there will be an increase in production there will be a successful uh rebooting of the primary economy and that jobs mm -hmm. will be created and that people will be spending money and and that you know if we bet if we put our money down now we're gonna reap a reward later and uh and we'll be able to basically pay off this this debt over time um even though the debt keeps expanding so i just i want to like put forward the the fact that um all all the things that are being done um, are being done to, in order to help reproduce capital. 
Mm-hmm. But that doesn't mean that, that that they're being done in order to reproduce the working class or keep the same living standards for the working class. No, of course not. By, by any means. That's not the same <laughs> no. thing at all. Um, and when we look at today's unemployment numbers in the United States, which is at um, 3.5%, percent like it's not it's not bad it's like three percent it's normal i think you know um uh we have to take into account the amount of damage that was done to the labor force over the last what is it now uh uh 15 years something like that 14 years um since uh the economic crisis uh i think it's 15 years ago it started in 2007 um the, the my understanding is that the number of permanently unemployed uh people people you don't it's it's wrong to even call them workers because the way workers are defined are it's as job seekers you know on some level that they want a job these are people who've been shoved out of the labor pool altogether um that that number i'm I'm not sure what the proper estimation is of that number i don't i can't i could not easily uh discover what the the number would be but it has increased overall since 2008 um and then you hear about it in particular particular ways um in the media but it's never brought up as a directly just as a, a problem with the labor force and and having an economic consequence it's always like these social consequences that are so concerning like the incel movement and and the displaced men and uh, you know, the, or or uh, and um, the crime rate and and things like that are, are brought brought up, but mm-hmm. that that is a consequence of the um, underemployment that's become permanent in in our economy and I think around the world. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, and uh, you know what capital is going to do with all those young men with time on their hands? Can you guess? Anybody maybe at home want to guess what capital is going to do with them? It's going to make them all famous. They're all going to become rock stars and have huge internet, you know, micro niche (laughs) celebrity careers. It's not. No. But what are you thinking they're going to do? They're going to try to enlist them to in the battle for capital destruction, i.e. wars. That's exactly what they're going to do. And you know that they, that the CIA isn't stupid. They know that a situation where you have lots of men, young men, unattached young men is, they say, a volatile situation. Uh, If you have lots of unattached young men, you will usually have riots, you will have um, social uh, disorganization, that sort of thing. This is, they have like a, a list of four things that they say leads to uh, uh, social unrest. And one of them is a lot of men with nothing to do. So, uh, which is very, very convenient because at the moment there needs to be an enormous amount of capital destruction. And so they are already in Russia trying their very best to round up all these, because Russia has this this same problem as well with um, Mm -hmm. these sorts of online movements that are mainly sort of driven by uh, men with no hope and no future. Um, and so they're they're and I'm not saying that they're directly doing this like <laughs> consciously, but who knows? Like they seem to be they have their finger on the pulse. Um, but anyways, they need they need these bodies to go be cannon fodder. Um, they need to there needs to, part of the destruction that's quote unquote needs to happen within capitalism to try and um, reset the profit rate or um, bring around a new round of accumulation is destruction of human beings as well. And the people who are left behind supposedly reap the benefits. So this is what happened in the 1950s. Um, the people who are left behind benefited from higher wages, that sort of thing. Um, this is, you know, they, now what's really terrifying is that we've been through this before, obviously, been through this twice before. And because we've been through this twice before, no one has been willing to allow for the amount of capital destruction that's necessary to allow for a new round of accumulation, nor should they, because that's mm-hmm. horrific, disgusting, and entirely unnecessary. Do mm-hmm. <laughs> so you know what I always think? I think of it this way. You can imagine if we landed on another planet and you, you get off the, the spacecraft and you look around and it's just a beautiful planet and there's just food growing everywhere and it's just wealth, abundance, high technology. You're like, wow, we've landed in utopia. 
And then you look around, you look a bit further, you go, oh my God, what are they doing? There's this giant bonfire and they're just throwing everything into it and they're burning the food. And you're like, hey, hey, what are you doing? And they're like, oh, well, we have these beads that tell us when to make things. <laughs> and the beads don't seem to be matching up anymore. There's something wrong with the beads. And you're like, uh, but look out into the world. <laughs> Why don't you just go pick the apples off mm -hmm. the trees and eat them? This is what mm -hmm. we're doing. We live in this extraordinary world of, of wealth and we're blowing it up because there's something wrong with the beads and we can't figure out what it is. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely shocking. Yeah, I, I want to I want to throw a comment from one of the viewers on the screen here, because this is in response, I think, to your uh, claim, which I think is largely correct, that um, they want to take the surplus population and turn them into soldiers. And someone says, I disagree. There's a shortage of population. There's an old population, which is why they use mercenaries. And I think that uh, in the United States, the number of people who are really of that, you know, soldiering age who are part of that surplus population that is completely off, out of the labor market um, that are over, let's say 35 or, you know, and, and deconditioned, you know, the, the, these, these people are living often on disability checks is what I understand. And which means that they're often uh, hooked on opiates as well. So they have these lifestyles that I heard on breaking points, um, uh, their, their life to, style being described as a lifestyle of a watcher. What they do is they watch. They watch TV or they watch the internet. Maybe they play video games, but they watch. They look at screens and they view the world from, you know, darkened basements, you know, the cliche or, or wherever they are, and they don't participate. Um, so I would think that you would be taking up um, a surplus population that would be younger uh, if possible. And I think that would be different in different parts of the world. Like in Russia, they may have much, many more young men than we do here. The Zoomer population is smaller than the millennial population was, for instance. Um, but overall, I think you're, you're correct. Um, and it just, it's difficult for me to imagine uh, how, I mean, there's a reason why capitalist bourgeois politicians have been reluctant to use war uh, and go to war with each other the way they had in the past. And it's not only because of, um, uh, you know, uh, I think an actual aim of bourgeois politics, which is to cr try to create peace. I think actually that is a goal that you know, ideologically, but also it's because um, the amount of the, the, the instruments of destruction are so terrible now that that the yeah. destruction of capital and people would could be so severe that there would be no rebuilding there would be no coming back <clears throat> i mean that's that's the big fear of nuclear armageddon that's uh, and then so the other thing to, about war is that it determines who's going to be winners and who who are going to be the losers uh during after a collapse right who's going to get mm -hmm. to reinvest who's going to come out on top and be the strongest yeah, exactly. Uh, and, like you uh, could be the one that gets screwed, right? Like, <laughs> well, the Amer Americans certainly believe that we have a good shot. We've done it before. <laughs> you know? Well, here's the thing: like the desperation can get to be so enormous that you're willing to take the risk. And this is this is the thing that's that's happening. Like as I was saying, nobody was has been willing to go to war because of what you just said, because of mutually assured destruction. Um, but now they're willing to flirt with it because the pull the, the push factors i suppose are so strong um you know like you've got all this steel and there's nothing to do with it so you make bullets right <laughs> like it like the the need for destruction the need for a place for investment is pushing people to be so you know to, to do things that are insane but now that's where we are that's where we are uh, we've actually reached that point where they can't do it. And the other reason too, why they haven't wanted to go to war is because war isn't just destructive. It also radicalizes people like during the, what wars do is um, they train, not only do they take these young men out of their basements, but they train them and they bring them together and organize them into a military. And that can also be a very dangerous thing. 
Mm. Um, and you know, you almost had um, you almost had communist revolutions in Europe in the 1940s. You know, Spain, Greece, even. Um, that's also quite a serious thing that they've wanted to avoid. That these these situations of serious, not just war, but the lead up to the war, the 1930s. This was a serious mm. period of radicalization as well, and that's something that they've wanted to avoid. Right. Um, I, I have to throw a few more quotes of uh, comments up. If you notice that while you were saying very you. serious things, I'm like suppressing a smile. It's because I'm looking at these comments and someone says, this from, just reminds me of one of the final scenes of the movie Zardoz, where the brutals attack the immortals and the immortals scream, kill me first. Um, and someone else writes, uh, Doug talking about me is making me sad. I'm sorry. And I wasn't thinking of <laughs> you particularly um we've uh, made all the people all the basement dwellers sitting in the the soft blue light of their screens in the darkness now they're all feeling quite self-aware and depressed one of the things i want to go back to is you, you said you know this downturn can be radicalizing and you can look to the 30s um uh as a time of radicalization but those communist movements for communism um either were absorbed into the soviet sphere um, mm -hmm. or just were crushed right yeah. at, at that time and um i would say that it has become more difficult to conceive of the politics of communism since for you know since uh, the russian revolution um uh or sometime after and that in that one way of conceiving of the struggle for socialism is also to con to think of it as the struggle to properly understand what the struggle is aiming at mm -hmm. um, and to, to develop a politics around that understanding. Um, I like to think of it that way because uh, uh, it allows me to justify continuing to read books while um, Putin is bombing uh, Kiev and, uh, you know, the war is uh, escalating. That, that happened this morning, by the way, that the re re in retaliation to the yeah. uh, bombing of the of the bridge uh, from Russia to Ukraine. Um, An enormously expensive bridge, by the way, like uh, astronomically expensive, you know, bombed, not destroyed, but seriously. It was disabled, yeah. Yeah. Um, so this is just another example of enormous capital destruction and they're just going to keep doing it. It's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. <laughs> it's, it's an, it's an odd moment because um, last mm -hmm. week the New York times released a, uh, an article um, that could have been directly issued from the, the state department. It, 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 basically it was hard to tell. I mean, Matt Taibbi said uh, that it was difficult to tell who this article is really aimed at. Was it aimed at, Ukraine was it aimed at the it certainly wasn't aimed at the US public was it aimed at Putin but it was basically denouncing the Ukrainian uh assassination of I think Dugan's daughter that that it turned out that they they said this was a Ukrainian operation the United States um it was opposed to it uh this demonstrates the um reach of the Ukrainian secret service and the the danger that they present um and so there seems like right now the U.S. might be trying to get a little bit of distance from the war effort, mm. um, uh, but it you know it's unclear. It's 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 unclear as to what. Well, the popular you know. tide of opinion has started to turn. Um, somebody who was it that gave a speech? Uh, this populist was it the Italian, the new Italian uh, leader that they gave this mm -hmm. speech, and they were like. And also for the people of Ukraine and the and the crowd of her supporters was like, mm -hmm. <laughs> right. I mean, that's a, that is a special case because she is one of these new populist uh, conservative uh, reactionary leaders that's come that are taking power in Europe right now, and her base from the beginning was opposed to the the actions in the Ukraine, and she mm -hmm. all along was, you know, qu uh, not quietly, but she was for the 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 uh, nato's involvement in ukraine and um i i think that's just an issue where she and is out of step with her uh base and you know trump was in in some ways similar i remember after trump took 
power and then uh i think he hmm. dropped the mother of all bombs on syria um and like richard spencer was up in arms uh, <laughs> about that so um the, these populist politicians that take power are are not likely to really change course um hmm. from the from the overall consensus when it comes to foreign power and foreign uh, uh, policy. Um, well, I don't see why the United States would want to try to distance itself in reality, maybe ideologically, but in reality, they, they're banking on uh, expansion and they're basically fighting with Russia for expansion into Europe. I think that's part of what this is all about. I, you know, I don't, I, I, the game is so, it's a game of chicken really i mean because one of the things that you keep hearing on both sides i mean obviously the united states has not brought the full force of its military power to bear on in ukraine no right? can't they can't obviously right right and the the reverse is also true russia is holding back mm -hmm. from using all of the force that it could in fact this latest uh offensive using cruise missiles is breaking with the softer approach that russia was taking to its invasion um, so it, it, it's not a matter of military might. Um, it's a matter of like, it's, this, this is politics with, with bombs. It's like, which one of us is going to blink? Who's going to have to give, which one of us is, uh, more frightened of the consequences of, of our own military power, I think. is No, but I mean fun. like the, the underlying interests that are pushing them to do this in the first place. Like they're, they're both. Yeah, they're they're doing that to each other, but why? Because they they want access to the to the European markets. They want right. They pay. each one they each one want to be the ones who are going to be the winners in this overall moment of losing, right? And 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 the United States maybe appears weaker than it has for quite a while. So I guess I mean, I, but yeah, I, I, the the yeah, I mean. I believe that if the full power to devalue capital was unleashed, that we would not arise like a phoenix from the ashes. <laughs> <Okay>. Oh no! <laughs> the thing oh. is, I don't think they know. They, I don't think they are fully aware of what they're actually doing. They just know that they need. They've got to find foreign markets for this. Mm -hmm. um, for these, I don't know what to call it, like products. I, I suppose they have to find foreign markets for their products. This is obviously what obviously causes a lot of inter-imperialist warfare. That, and, they, and they're so desperate to do it that they're willing to, to go to war. Um, but it's not like they know, oh, look, for capitalism to continue its expansion, I need to blow up 100% of capital, <laughs> like kill right. so many people. And they're not aware of that. They don't realize what they're doing. Um, it's just was, it's, a conglomeration of so many interests, uh, you know, interests in, in like people who have nowhere, no profitable um, place for their steel, for example. OK, military um, uh, production, you know, excess population. OK, military production. Um, so there's, you know, oh, excess population, military, you know, there are all these pushes. But it's not like somebody's, you know, playing a game of chess and they know exactly what they're doing for the health of the capitalist system. People are just looking for profitable um, spaces for investment. Uh, and this leads to warfare at an enormous level. Right. I mean, it's a very complicated game because on the, you say everyone's looking for a market for their products, but the products now that are being produced aren't really national products anymore because mm -hmm. of the intricacy of the supply chain. So you have like, right. you have products that are produced, you know, uh, out of, uh, you know, 10 different nations that, the you know, they're the raw materials comes from, let's say S South America. And then the first round of, of, of in industrial, you know, production is put upon, uh, you know, placed upon those raw materials and in, in like say ta uh, Taiwan. And then you from Taiwan, mm. you go to, it goes to China for the cheap 
manufacturer and then it goes into europe for the pol like you know we have the nice bags to put these products in and the nice wrapping and the design mm. you know from from steve jobs the, the final step is the european you know production process or something like that and and then it and then it gets shipped off to the united states where you know through uh, credit card debt we purchase the things i mean yeah. uh, this is a simplistic and not accurate um uh, description but the point is that there these products are in are neoliberal products are internationally developed products mm -hmm. and so one of the other things being kind of i think worked out is just to what extent can we bring the majority of uh, certain kinds of production into the different nation into our own nation wherever we might be mm -hmm. and and how can and who's going to control these regions um which aren't militarily developed uh in order to control that kind of production like for instance taiwan um mm -hmm. so that's the other thing that's being fought over here and it, it's no one wants to like nuke taiwan and destroy the capital there they want to control Taiwan and that that part of the supply chain um mm -hmm. but even if you know but whoever did that would still be facing the profitability crisis which is what's bringing all this in this conflict out in the begin to begin with I think um so I'll let you respond to, to that and then maybe we have this 10 minute clip from the interview with Conrad we could try to try to get to him well actually the there was this um there was a quote that was going around on Twitter that I actually wanted to screenshot. I couldn't find it again, though. Um, but it was something like, um, Ukraine is like a worm that thinks it's going fishing with the fishermen. <laughs> uh -huh. so, yeah, it's a sad image, but it is, it is literally, that is what's true. And it seemed to me like there are many, many times where it seemed like um, Ukraine, well, maybe not Ukraine, but um, Zelensky had wanted to, you know, negotiate to stop or arrest the destruction, but the U.S. was just bigging them up. The whole world was just like, you know, no, 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 because this is the thing that they wanted. This was their ticket, and this is exactly, you know, they're they're using Ukraine as a worm because they can't go. Well, they can't. I'm going to break the metaphor now, but they can't go fighting again. They can't fight directly against each other. Not yet. They're not willing to. Not yet. But they will. I think. You yeah, think, I think so? They will. Well, on that note, let's transition over into a conversation about socialism as a transitional period uh, after revolution. I'm kind of a much more optimistic conversation I uh, had with uh, Conrad Hamilton about um, just what would work after a revolution to start to uh, shift away from capitalist production. And, create, and actually, this uh, war might give us the, well, might who knows about the realm of possibility, but in terms of like available chess moves might actually give us a possibility to get there, but play the yeah, well, we, may, we should talk about that in the uh, parrot room. Uh, we'll talk about how to have a revolution for the patrons only. That's just a, to, the, this is our Vanguard. <laughs> step <approach>. by step. <laughs> <laughs> we have okay. all the answers. So um, here is uh, this uh, 10 minute clip from a conversation I had with, Conrad Hamilton, who I always describe as a contemporary Stalinist. So here he is, Conrad Hamilton. You wrote a piece for Sublation Magazine. It's a long piece. It's called The Society of the Social Consumption Fund, Marks and Labor Certificates. That's the title that's at the top of it right now. We can re yeah. re we'll probably retitle that as something like the critique of the Gotha program was sexy and we'll put like a couple people in like bathing suits at the top to get those clicks. Yeah, on. that'd be that'd be typical yeah. classic sublation move. You start out talking about how um, Marx's method did not lead him to define or describe scientific socialism or socialism at all very often. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. um, but the, what you are aiming at in the piece is to to understand what was what Marx meant by labor certificates, particularly, mm -hmm. and the yep. limitation of his suggestions in the critique of the Gotha program. And, you know, um, you, you submitted, submitted this at a time when Spencer Leonard was leaving Sublation and he was mm -hmm. giving you one sort of edit. And then I stepped in in my typical uh, left calm way and gave you my kind of uh, uh, edit. Well, sometimes I think like an actual editor, sometimes more like some sort of ideologue. Um, 
But maybe, I'm it's, maybe, take... it's a, maybe it's appropriate that a piece on, you know, su successive stages of transition ended up being published, you know, when there were stages <laughs> of transition. That's a right. Definitely going through some transitions right now. Daniel Tutt, for example, he's sort of, I think, quite effectively uh, talked about how um, we could probably uh, break sort of like the or, or divide, uh, you know, kind of the Western or the American left more specifically um, into or socialist left into uh, three columns. Right. Um, and one of those uh, is, um, I guess, what you'd characterize as sort of tankies, like Marxist Leninists, right? You have some sort of, you know, sometimes equivocal, but, uh, you know, a sort of loyalty in any case uh, to the legacy of actually uh, existing socialism and, and the Third International, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, and another one uh, is sort of DSA, right? Democratic Socialism, you know, Sanders, Reformist Program, you know, a certain kind of emulation of Scandinavia and all of that. Um, and the third one he characterized as being, and I, I, I am not going to be repeating his exact terms, um, but it's sort of a, an anarcho-communist kind of formation um, that has become very, very, um, you know, involved um, with value theoretical analysis, right, to the extent that that um, anarcho-communist or left-communist impulse uh, is premised on the idea that, you know, we need to uh, actually uh, get rid of the value form itself. Marx, uh, you know, was critical of some of the um, sort of wild uh, propositions, right, put forth uh, by the utopian socialists, um, you know, not not wholly unappreciative, right, and certain aspects of that, um, I'm thinking of Owen in particular, do end up synthesized in this text. Um, but, you know, part of this is that, you know, Marx was attempting to uh, pursue a kind of dialectical method to focus on, um, you know, a representation of the future from the standpoint of the, the present, right, so kind of following naturally from the is rather than going immediately to the ought, um, and so there's not really many texts, right? Um, you know, very, very few of comments in like the third volume of Capital and the realm of freedom and this kind of thing. But there's really not many texts where Marx, you know, kind of stipulates what he would imagine, um, you know, socialist or communist transition to look like, right? Um, and so that I feel like if we're having these kind of debates between these sort of, um, you know, ideological uh, factions within the socialist left, this is a really, really important text to uh, analyze, to try to reach any kind of conclusion um, regarding um, to what extent, you know, the ideas being put forth um, by these different segments are in conformance with what Marx was proposing. Of course, whether we should just do what he was proposing is another question. <clears throat> I think the question becomes, how will you actually uh, set up such a society, right? And I think you can immediately uh, point to certain deficiencies uh, that begin to emerge, right? Um, so one of this, you know, has to do with the, uh, the relationship between uh, supply and demand. Right. Uh, because obviously one of the functions of price, right, is to represent distinctions between supply and demand. Right. Um, so, you know, even if, you know, an equal amount of socially necessary labor time goes into the production of apples and oranges. Right. Let's imagine. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, if there's some sort of crop rot or something. Right. And there's an extreme shortage of apples. Right. You can raise the price of apples, which is quite outside, you know, the question of the quotient of labor. Right. Or socially necessary labor actually em uh, employed to pr to to create those. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think the first problem you kind of have is that, you know, if you're exchanging things based on an equal amount of labor time, right, um, how do you actually negotiate, uh, these sort of difficulties, right? So if there's, if there's, you know, if some, if there's a much smaller quantum, mm -hmm. right, of a certain good, right, who are you going to distribute that to, right? Uh, when you can't have recourse mm -hmm. to price, right, as a means of, of redistribution. Now, the second, uh, you know, another major problem, um, you know, is just, uh, simply the... Uh, the calculation of this itself, you know, in such a society, right, um, there are big differences um, in productivity, right, in the productivity of labor, uh, which traverse any society, right, um, yeah. you know, and this is, they're particularly acute when you look at, you know, different countries, right, you look at places in the third world, right, where the productivity of labor is like much lower than in the first world, for example, mm -hmm. right. Um, so, so the third problem that I would point to, right, um, is that if you're simply, um, you know, exchanging on the basis of time, right, um, you're mm -hmm. effectively erasing, right, uh, all of the distinctions between productivity, which exists. Now, these are represented within the, nor within the normal structure of value that we have and that Marx points out uh, illustrates in Capital, mm -hmm. right? Um, because, uh, you know, uh, and, and Marx has different terms. He talks about uh, productivity, intensity, and skill, right? And we could get into that, but it's a bit complicated. But the point here is that, you know, the very category of socially necessary labor time, right, implies that uh, there's a normative standard right, uh, of productivity, which ossifies within, you know, a given context, 
right? Um, you know, and your time will not be as useful as another time to the formation of value, right? If you're not functioning at that level of productivity. Um, the, what you just talked about, Marx does mention, which yeah. is that says um, uh, when you are using labor certificates, um, the equal right to, to take from the common store, the same that you put in becomes an unequal right for unequal labor because not every worker is like every other. And yeah. some are have a more of an endowment might be stronger sure. or, or quicker of the mind, more sure. uh, uh, just have better with their hands and they're therefore more productive. So in the case of just one comparing one worker to another, one worker who takes it longer to produce the same amount of widgets per hour than yeah. the other would get the same amount of widgets back as the other. Yeah. yeah. So the, those labor certificates sure. is, is not equal. And, and yeah. one of the things, if you stop and think about the labor certificates for a while, which I think you may have pointed out as your second point is that there is no way to really calculate how much of uh, any given commodity should be received for a certificate. What what is you know what's an hour worth in in as when measured in terms of Twinkies or iPhones or yeah. cars? It's a big, it's you a know, big, it's, a, it's a big problem. Yeah, right. And the um, the way that the Mark spends quite a bit of time in capital is explaining mm -hmm. how those relations are obtained through capitalist mm -hmm. production. Here yeah. he's not talking about the entirety of of the system and how these relationships are set up, but really just uh, trying to ad address, as I said at the start, like this proposal in the Gotha program that uh, ever that what should be aimed at is that every worker gets the full share of what they, uh, the of the work that they put in. Right. So, that, but here's, it, here's the problem with what, with what you're saying. So I agree with you that that comes somewhat close to what I'm saying mm -hmm. on that point. Right. But the mm -hmm. problem is that when Marx talks about one worker being stronger, um, you know, Marx talks about, um, you know, three ways, um, you know, in which, uh, well, you know, three ways in which, um, you know, the productivity of labor, so to speak, uh, could diverge from uh, a socially necessary standard, right? And that has to do with, it's actually, it's a big problem in his work, really, but that has to do with uh, productivity, intensity, and skill, right? So loosely speaking, we can say skill, the capacity of the worker, intensity, how hard they're kind of going, right? Um, and productivity, um, which is really, I think, often a reflection simply of automation uh, and other processes of social and managerial development, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it's not taken up like on a collective level, right? So it's not, you know, in other words, it's not a question. That's in the Gotha program or? or in, in, in the Gotha in the, program. I'm saying Marx doesn't right, take no, that up right. on a collective level. So he's not talking about distinctions between nations and things like this. Right? No, so he's it not. Gets, it, it gets mm -hmm. to what I said. I mean, it ends up being, I think, um, well, the point he puts forth there uh, is, is quite an individualistic and moralistic kind of critique. Um, you know, and it's not one that really gets us into the nuts and bolts, right. Of how that would really function at a broader level. Right. right. I'm not and saying I it's just, completely removed from that. Right. Right. And I would just say again, that that is a consequence of the, the context in which it was written, which was in response to these very abstract statements of principle in the Gotha program. All right. So there's that 10 minute clip. I don't know. What, what did you make of that? Ashley, did you? follow along was that easy to understand or was it a bunch of yeah know, um new insider this is i think this is the kind of conversation that we need to be having quite seriously and i feel like when people think oh well i have the solution here's what we're going to do like i know ted reese kind of does this a little bit much as i love ted i'm i'm a little suspicious not suspicious but skeptical i suppose when he says what we really need to do is we need to move to a labor chit system and the labor chit system you know once you purchase your commodities that it disappears like you don't accumulate mm -hmm. something like that i'm probably mischaracterizing it i feel like <laughs> to kind of put forward the solution with so much certainty is madness because we have tried once and failed miserably and the solution is not something we can like glean from some text like a hundred and whatever years ago. Um, this is something we really need to think about. We, we need the very, very best minds to come together and think, okay, 
first of all, we need to, he's, he, like, this is a, a good point that he made was like the is and the ought, right? You can't just have the ought, you need to have a good understanding, a, a, a very good understanding of the is, right? Mm -hmm. Before we can move to the ought. And for a very, very long time, we've had it shoved down our throat that the is is external to capitalism. That, you, that capitalism works in equilibrium. And the reason why this equilibrium doesn't actually exist in reality is because of us. <laughs> because, because we're not doing what we ought to do. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and we can't. We can't because there's this, there's a, a general kind of problem with human beings. We just simply cannot possess the rationality that's required in order to, to make this. The system is too good for us, right? Which precludes... Um, basically any solution, but also any human involvement in the economy, right? Because it's just too complex and it's impossible for human beings to understand. So for a very long time, we've had that shoved down our throat, that there's no such thing as an endemic problem. But uh, I say this all the time. I talked about this on um, TIR on Saturday, but for those who were not listening, um, classical economics had a very strong understanding of the fact that there were things, not just Marx, but that there were problems that were endemic to capitalism. And there were, and there were puzzles that need to be solved. Like, why does this happen? Like monopoly or, or the falling rate of profit. It was accepted that these things were outcomes of an internal working within capitalism. It's proper functioning, not a breakdown, but a, it's mm. proper functioning led to these mm. issues. Mm. And what happened was neoclassical economics banished that understanding. Um, and so everything now has to be external. So monopoly is understood in terms of the institutions that surround the system and people fucking it up, basically. Um, and we have to under we have to take as our jumping off point that classical economic understanding, for God's sake, for finally, that it is endemic. These are endemic issues to the system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I will be I will be an optimistic centrist. Hey, maybe if we can understand them, it doesn't require revolutionary overthrow. Sure, okay. I don't think so because if you understand <laughs> them as endemically, they it seems to me that they because they are the result of the proper functioning of the system, it, it can't they can't be solved within the system as we know it. But mm -hmm. we have to understand that. Uh, we have to put our it's not just going to be some guy like who's like I have the solution. Like we we've got to figure this out. It's really mm -hmm. really serious. And the solution, you know, Mark says, no, man never sets himself a problem that he doesn't already have the answer to. The solution already exists in our society. We are mm -hmm. already doing something that the continuation of which will bring us can not will can bring us forward into the future. The mm -hmm. question is, what is that? Yeah, uh, I, I just want to um, underscore a, a, a point about this particular essay and about my the particular conversation with uh, Conrad Hamilton. Well, what I was going to say is that thing is not labor chits. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Money. Well, I mean, well, I we think that, 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 that it, you know, th this idea that, oh, well, we're not going to find all the answers in text from uh, 100 years ago is true enough. And we especially aren't going to find them if we don't read those uh, essays and books mm -hmm. well. I'm not saying don't read them. I'm saying they, mm -hmm. they're the jumping off point. It's not like, oh, I have a solution. Here we go. Well, we right. Have, and one, Does that one of the still I, apply? You know? yeah, one of the things I kept coming back to with, with Conrad and, which, and when I was editing the piece that I pointed out uh, over and over again and then eventually demand uh, 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 dropped because I realized that what I was demanding of him was to write something completely different than what he had written um, <laughs> was that uh, the, the critique of the Gotha program is a critique. It is not a positive prescription for social. Yes. Yes. And, and um, even as Marx himself proposes labor certificates uh, in one paragraph in the next two or three, he outlines all the ways in which, the uh, labor certificates are deficient and all mm -hmm. the ways they won't reach the aim, the goal that's stated by the people who wrote the Gotha program, the Lasallian goal of um, creating a fair uh, distribution mm -hmm. uh, that uh, what he uh, tries to posit is what he calls uh, a kind of temporary measure to help workers uh cope psychologically he even talks about this as something that has to do with their subjectivity in their mind with the the 
the change that will be occurring after revolution. So these mm. are people marked by capitalist relations who may will need a transitionary form in order to understand the new reality. And the new reality mm. is communism. The new reality is from each according to their ability to each according to their need, yeah. not from each according to a certain, you know, from each certain number of labor hours to each a certain number of labor certificates. That is not the new reality. That is actually only posited as something which will allow everyone to understand the deficiency of using labor time to mediate our social relations. Mm -hmm. that, that's at least what I got out of reading Cap, uh, uh, Capital, but all, uh, the Gotha program. Um, and it takes a while because reading the critique of the Goth program is very frustrating because if you take him to be saying, here's my solution, this will work. And then uh, you, you you can start to think of objections. And then he vo puts those objections into his, his mm -hmm. own writing. He, he voices those objections for you. You just start to like you, you say, what, what is the point of this? And then you have to re remember, he is not prescribing. He is critiquing. And, mm -hmm. No, it's not the first time either. And the Grundrisse, <laughs> he gives right. a very detailed critique of labor chits. Um, mm -hmm. Although the reason for the critique of labor chits in this particular instance is that they think that they can abolish the people that he's criticizing. I can't remember who it is. Might be back. Uh, um, but the people who he's criticizing had suggested that money was the root of all evil. And so they were just going to like abolish money and replace it with labor chits. And then he explains how, no, so long as we're still within the capitalist system, that's not gonna do anything. So mm -hmm. that's his, so it, at least he takes it, not at least, but within the, Goth the Gotha program, he takes it a, a little bit further where it's like, okay, even within a socialist program, it's only an interim, if anything, it's an interim Right, step. I mean, he, he's, he's presupposing this common store of goods right. that was, is held in uh, collectively. In Amazon warehouses uh, no no <laughs> <laughs> held collectively by a, the dictatorship of the proletariat i think who have point. taken over the amazon warehouse sorry go on no it could be the amazon <laughs> warehouses and held in. who knows where else it could be held all over the place but the but the, the point is he is imagining he's i think he's imagining these labor, these labor certificates as something that would be operative perhaps during a, 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 a moment where capitalist production, the commodity production had already ended, mm -hmm. that that and a yeah. new form of production was 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 being developed or it was, had taken hold. That's that's my left communist position. I'm willing to defend it. But mm -hmm. I think we have to be able to uh, have these kinds of conversations. We have it, to. This has to be where all of our energy is. And the thing, sorry, I cut you off. Go ahead. You no, know, go ahead. No, I like that you're you're confirming me. So you, you cut me <laughs> off to confirm me. Go ahead. No, this is where all of our energy needs to be because this is the thing that bugs me. Like it's it's like this is not an identity. This is not a game. This isn't a way to distinguish yourself from the rest of the people who are too stupid or whatever. This is fucking serious. Like we're mm. on the verge of blowing up the world. Like we're talking about that. Like, it's all right. Like, maybe, maybe we will. No, we won't. Maybe we will. You know, this is a serious conversation that we're having. You know, it's it's insane. And the reason is because it is endemic to the system. It's endemic to this particular system, which creates enormous amounts of wealth and then destroys it periodically. That's insane. We have to find a way. We have to find a way out of it. It's, you know, I don't. I don't want you guys to have to go to war. I don't want my children, like the Ukraine, like Ukrainian children, to get gunned down for the mm. glorious cause of the bourgeoisie, for the glorious cause of what? A boom, maybe, that might last. Like we we killed however tens of millions of people in the Second World War to produce a boom that lasted, I don't know, 15, 20 years or something. Mm. Like what 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 is that? This is horrifying. So, first of all, we need to. We need to have a serious, we need to be seriously thinking, how the fuck are we going to get out of this? Is it possible? Is there is there a way forward? And it's not like some doctrinaire thing, like, oh, I'm going to own you. We need to come together and, right. and sort this and find a solution. Seriously, maybe there isn't one, but we have to try. It's, yeah. it's, it's very serious. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And one of the things that worries me is how, uh, when you hear the bourgeois politicians themselves say, uh, state the the seriousness of the crisis. Um, 
like I recall Alan Greenspan saying something like, yeah, I was ideologically captured and the system failed. And this is a crisis of capitalism itself, a, a crisis of the system itself in 2008. And that admission came forward and then there was really no change. Right. Mm -hmm. And right now we're being told by Biden in the United States, this is as close to nuclear Armageddon as we've gotten since the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, this is very serious. If, if tactical nukes are used, there may be no way out of the, uh, you know, except through Armageddon. In other words, there may be no uh, solution. Um, and we all hear this and uh, uh, we start to parse it and think about it in terms of political factions and messaging and um and what There's i think no point in messaging if you don't have an answer like right what are you right, well, I, right well like you know the critics are saying biden needs to tell uh putin that we have a conventional response which will devastate russia and with that that will therefore stop him from using tactical nukes without himself escalating the nuclear threat that's what people will say and i you know okay maybe he needs to do that but the reality is clearly that none of the politicians who are working to manage the current system can manage this current system mm -hmm. and working people should look to one another to try to find a different way to organize this world because this way is threatening us with Armageddon every other week. I mean, this time right now, it's a threat of nuclear war, and, and it's a very, very serious threat. But, you know, on a good day, it's climate change and mass unemployment and mm -hmm. starvation and proxy wars. And No, no, know. for me, it was always this. I knew that I said I've been saying this for 12 years. All of these other things, like climate change and so on, like, I can, I can have faith. I can sit back and have faith that humanity might figure it out within the context of capitalism. It might take a long time to make it profitable and it, much longer than it is necessary, but maybe we could figure it out. This, no, I knew that this was coming. And maybe this is why, like in five years, we might all laugh at me. Oh, it was just another, you know. No, I, I, no look, look, <laughs> you weren't alone. Most Marxists like at the time of the economic crisis were saying, look, we're the threat of nuclear war is, is increasing starting mm -hmm. now right you know so you weren't wrong i mean i agreed with you ideologically i agreed with you but now it's not coming from you ashley it's coming from <laughs> the president of the united states you know like now mm -hmm. no one can deny that what you're claiming we're, we're we're claiming was a major risk for all of humanity if we didn't break from capitalism and and this kind of uh, structuring of society you were saying it before and other people like you small you know Marxist weirdos and different from different <laughs> sects all over the world. Now it's being said by the bourgeois politicians themselves, and I mm -hmm. do think that that's worth worth noting. Um, mm -hmm. We've we've gone over an hour, and uh, what I think we ought to do now is um, is give me a chance to get some coffee. And I don't know, I I I'm feeling right now like maybe I'll start day drinking it. Well, I, I finished my book, and so I'm going to go, and I'm going to get myself a little bottle of champagne. Oh, I can't because I'm at work. <laughs> oh, no. Well, <laughs> I'm not. Okay. It's like 6, it's 6 p.m. here, so it's not working hours, but I totally forgot I'm in my office, so I can't. But, Dad, I'm going to get myself <laughs> a really nice hot cup of tea. <laughs> mm -hmm. but i've been no. wanting to celebrate i finished my book um but also there is there's some comments that people have put up here that i'm going to respond to so everybody i want you to come to the patreon please <laughs> and yeah, someone up. wrote something about accelerationism i really want to respond to that um so we'll be back in what 10 but, 15 minutes yeah 10 15 minutes so the the link is already there on um, the patreon um, and we'll be back in about 10 to 15 minutes. And uh, thanks to everybody for, for watching today. I think this thing where I don't write down everything in advance and we talk more normally works better. What do you think? Ashley? I think so too. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't, I also, I don't write lecture notes. I'm like, I'm free and I don't yeah. feel so nervous, you know? <laughs> All right. So I'll see you in about 10 minutes. All right. Bye-bye. In the case of nuclear or radiological fallout, People living around potential targets such as military bases and chemical plants.